Um, you know, we spoke about Vrindavan. Uh, Vrindavan, you know, everything run by Radharani, and people say, hey, Radhe, Radhe, uh, Radhe, Radhe, which is totally opposite of the mood of our Guru Varga. And it, it says, Avam Param Param Praptam, which means, due to the course of time, spiritual knowledge get dissolved. This is the natural process. There's a game of one speaking to whisper to ear of somebody else. So if people whisper the same thing, on the end of the, the word become different. So that means through the sibling succession, also knowledge can be lost. That's actually a real second meaning of Krishna's speaking in Gita. However, I listened to the Chaitanya Charitamrita. It was very interesting because after our Gurudev left the world and he actually had the will. You know, everyone has his own understanding of the will according to his own realization, position, and, uh, you know, relationship with others. So, as, you know, Acharya work never worked because it was never the same understanding. But, you know, there are different gurus, different disciples, there are, you know, followers of this Maharaj, that Maharaj, another Maharaj, and, you know, then obviously someone like Shil Govinda Maharaj or someone like Prabhupada or something like Guru Maharaj, and Guru Maharaj, I wouldn't even think factor because he dealt with a small group of people. Govinda Maharaj, with his big heart, went all over the world and deal with the different kind of people, like one of the Prabhupada disciples group, which is your relatives, the Janar Maharaj, Goswami Maharaj. That's like a worshipable group of people with us. Then with some like us, his disciples, who's, you know, now already not at very young people and have their own followers and disciples. So as this has happened, distribution happened, obviously everyone accept Krishna consciousness according to his inner necessity, according to his understanding, according to his connection. Then the question is how to understand it. And today I've been listening to Chaitanya Charitamrita, chapter which describes the tree of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And he's talking about Vakreshwar Pandit and Shivananda Sain, and you know, obviously the main branch, Nityananda, but from him, these branches and sub branches. So when you really look at the tree, it makes a lot of sense because the tree is not just, you know, the tree could have, it could split in two or three main branches, all this coming from one root, but also you see there are different branches and sub-branches coming out of tree and some of that branches are life-giving and producing more some of that branches are ending but they're that doesn't mean that the trees end if some branch of tree become dry and got cut off or fell apart the tree continue his existence because it's uh you know it goes in different ways so as we this is the way for us to understand how krishna consciousness will work so it's always guru disciple, it's always heart to heart transaction. It's not like Christianity or Islam because it's not a political or you know um, a superficial idea. It's always it's a consciousness, you know. So consciousness has neurons. Neurons means exchange, and you know some lines are going towards a particular understanding, and some you know fruits are hanging low. Some fruits are going how some branches start giving flowers. Some branches, they're just there to maintain the tree. But So it gives me a lot of answer for what my internal questions are. Because in this very difficult time for us, in absence of Srila you know, Govinda Maharaj, we should really think, well, who is the people that will lead our community? And we have, we have some great preachers, great philosophers, you know, then, then also we have necessity of connect with everyday people, with their needs, with their problems, with their inquiries, and, you know, pretty much uh, give them very general but loving, affectionate services, Srila Govindamash have done. Because 
Shul Govind Marsh never uh, held us by philosophy. It was not his thing. He held us by the heart. And of course, time to time, for our own fortune, he would give some very deep understanding of Krishna consciousness, which most of us couldn't even understand at the time, and probably will never, or will take billions of births or billions of births to to get that in a very clear, deep way. And obviously somebody like Goswami Maharaj, who's interest only in Guru Maharaj's philosophy and, you know, extracting his ideas, it will take somebody to evolve to that level of understanding of Krishna consciousness. Meanwhile, we have, uh, you know, followers from China, their unique information that Krishna has father, mother, you know, that's like, hey, Krishna has father, mother, yes. <laughs> but still, connecting with Krishna consciousness, connecting with devotees, I see how they're progressing. See, because it would appear to be, oh, you have to be a very smart person and read a lot of book. But like Lilavati, she's here. Sometimes she would come to my lecture and I would give in Russian and she would stay like an hour. And I couldn't stand myself for an hour. <laughs> like, I, I couldn't stand certain devotees, even if I understand what they're speaking. <laughs> but I think why she's not getting any understanding, but she's present in the lecture. And I said to her, what makes you be here? And she said, well, I'm catching the vibration, the energy, the chi. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's, that's amazing because, see, Krishna consciousness, it's not, as Govinda Maharaj say, heart-to-heart -heart transaction. So one time when I was, my first preaching tour was in Ukraine, in Zaporozhye, which is now taken over by Russian army. It's a beautiful town which is famous for its own manufacturing of helicopters. Soviet time was big industrial plant. It was never the cultural plant, however. You know, it was not famous for like Petersburg or Moscow, for the theaters. But it's a big town and a lot of good people living there on the, on the river. You know, it's kind of like something like Austin. Mm -hmm. So, one it's hard to call this person devotee, but my first follower <laughs> called me up and he had an esoteric bookshop. So he was super impressed that Sanyasi is coming to town. He couldn't figure out that I become Sanyasi like yesterday. <laughs> he didn't know the details. He thought I'm some kind of exalted soul. So he booked me the chess, chess club. And when I came there, I said, so what's the time for the lectures? And he said, I book it from 11 o'clock in the morning till 11 o'clock at night. <laughs> and I said, geez. <laughs> and I said, show me the poster. And he advertised like such and such Swami is, will be speaking there from 11 till 11. And the program is like all day. Said, oh my God. You know, I thought no one will join, but believe it or not, I, I had like more than that, like I had maybe 20, 30 people at 11 in the morning. <laughs> then I started to represent the spiritual things, and it took for one, two, three, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And by the time it was 11, I was pretty much done. <laughs> and some people stay halfway, some people stayed one hour, some people came, eat something, come back, <laughs> visit them. <laughs> So it happened to be that they brought their friends, somebody left, you know, it's all depending what people, what, what, what this advertising was, I'm not sure, but the people came. So one old babushka, maybe second day she came and she sees in front of me and she <laughs> fell to sleep. So she would come every day for my lecture because it was like Saptaha, seven days. And she would look at me and within 15 to 20 minutes, fell sleeping. And she was maybe in her 70s or something. So on the very last moment, I said, well, um, you've been coming here regularly. Uh, I'd like to say, what, what was inspiration for you to come? And she's like, oh, I saw you in doctor-like dress. I thought you were a doctor. 
because that was a sannyasi dress, like, you know, to her, like, it's like a doctor dress. And she said, and I came in, and I had a chronic disease of, I wasn't able to sleep for 20 years. I had internal inspiration to come, and within 15 minutes, I fell to sleep, and I slept all through the lecture. <laughs> and I wake up, and I felt amazing. So I, I, I understood you some kind of a healer exercise, so I started coming on a daily basis. I even called my friends. I don't know if they came or not. And by the way, she's from Zaporozhye. <laughs> she knows the place. Yes, yes. It's in the very, it's in the very central main street. But the amazing part of that, the amazing part of that connection with Krishna consciousness, she was completely unconscious and coming to a place without knowing what she would be exposed. And for the very first minute, she got benefit. There was one case with Siddhanti Maharaj when we were traveling and preaching together. And I was very determined to go because when I took sannyas, I couldn't be around my wife, my kids in Moscow or Petersburg. You know, I just had to like, I had to go like, I was like, you know, determined to go somewhere else where ideally if I can die, it's fine. Because that, you know, that's, it's a difficult moment when you're leaving everything. So you have to cut all your attachments. So you're on the road. So I would, some devotees invite us to Petrozavodsk, which is a place near Finland. It's more and more cooked towards Norway, the Murmansk. I was there in army. Then Sidanti Maharaj, he said, I can't tolerate this cold minus 35. It was like severe, like, Russian north winter, not Russian south. I said, it was really cold. And he said, I don't think I can make it. Get me a ticket back to Petersburg. I wait for you, Petersburg. I said, okay, I'll go by myself. No problem, don't worry. Then he said, no, I think I have to go with you. I cannot drop you. Then Sidanti Marsh changed his mind maybe a hundred times. <laughs> so finally I bought him ticket, and I said to the devotees, Okay, just about the same time, one train goes back to Petersburg, one train goes more north, more cold, more dark, because it's a polar night. And I thought, well, you know, thanks God, Sidanti Marsh is coming back to Petersburg, because it's very difficult to deal with his, you know, flickering mind every five minutes. As soon as train starts moving, I heard Sidanti Marsh's voice, he just, just, jump out of that Petersburg train and jump into my train. I said, oh my God, you don't even have a ticket. Okay, don't worry, you know, pay some cash. That time you could, you could do it. like, I can pay some cash to people. You sit, it was packed. You sit with me on a seat. And interestingly, one woman came in and she spoke to us and she wants like commit suicide. And after being with us on that train ride, it's like basically train to hell going more north. But I was there in army, you know, I, like I knew what it is. I knew, the, I knew the place. I was there, I was sentenced there in the military jail. I was like, this place, like I knew very well. What place was that? Mormonsk. So there was like a big hotel and so we had an advanced guy who would come and he would place little posters in little minivans, it's called like a taxi. It was like micro, it's like within Russia and Ukraine, it's very famous micro transportation where you have this minivan with 14, 16 seats. They're traveling and let you out where you want and you pay something. So we would advertise and this kind of like, this, this time was like no internet, nothing. It was just going, sticking bills, posters on the streets. So then, as we joined the Mormons, I said to Siddhanta Marsh, don't worry, I know this place. And the Bimal, the advanced guy, he already rent some apartment for us. You know, they're like, there was like places you can rent by day, an apartment. So we had an apartment and we had this hotel where we placed the program. So 
I said, let's do like Harinam. So we, we started doing Harinam in Murmansk. And that, that was the moment when we took Santa Claus hats and with Dandas made the pictures with reindeers. Because there were some people staying with the reindeers, we paid them a little something, you can take a picture with a reindeer. So when Gurudev spoke with one man who done business in Russia, the Indian guy, like, you know, very savvy Calcutta guy, he said, oh, have you been there? He says, yes, I've been there. I've been in Moscow, I've been in Petersburg. Gurdjieff like, have you been in the North? He said, yes, I've been in the North. Gurdjieff said, have you seen a uh, reindeer of the North? He said, no, I haven't seen it. Oh, no, he said, yes, I have seen the reindeer. He said, have you seen Sanyasin reindeer? <laughs> that Indian guy said, no, I haven't seen that. So Gurdjieff showed that picture. So in his album, there was a picture of me and Siddhantim are sitting on two reindeers with a Santa Claus has and carried the danda. So when we were doing Harinam, somebody came, come and see us chanting and give us the flowers. I was like, wow, what does that mean? Then we went on the street chanting Harinam and we met and one old woman stopped us. She's maybe, she's maybe in her 90s. And she's like, stop, stop. Please tell me what you are doing. I said, we're praying. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna, Krishna. She said, oh, then I've been waiting for you. I said, why? She said, because the angel came to me in a dream and told me that I will come down from my apartment on the street. And she said, I haven't been coming down from my apartment. I'm 90 years old, like, you know, almost like dying tomorrow. She said, I was told by Angel in a dream that if I come down on the street, I will receive something super important. Then we chant Hare Krishna with her, we give her the flowers and tell her like, this is the prayer. And she's like, okay, I understand. I'm ready to meet God. I think she'll like die next day or something. We'll never see her. But she was technically connect with the holy name and had an auspicious connection. Which tells me that Wow, you know, miracles happen. Suddenly you have women that in live drama, thinking of committing suicide, coming, stay with you a couple hours, speak about God, Krishna. And then she said, okay, I, I, now I have a hope. And she's like, okay, Bhagavad Gita. And she's like, or this old, like, when you are surrendered to Krishna, and interestingly, one time Gurudev said about one sannyasi, at this point he's fully surrendered to me. At this point. I thought, why Gurudev say that? But then later I understood why. But so that means are you always surrender soul or you surrender at the moment? But if some surrender, some self-giving to divine wave is happening, then there's some miracles going to happen. And, you know, the only obstacle, your own ego. Just like, you know, analyzing things happens around me and I'm thinking, and, you know, my ego tells me one thing, but my internal heart tells me, well, you know, when, thing, when something happens with you, that has nothing to do with external circumstance. That might be favorable or not. It has to be with you, with your own. Remember, Guru Maharaj said religion is proper adjustment. So, you know, being a preacher, a guru, normally you adjust other people. It's your job to adjust others. But Guru Maharaj said religion is proper adjustment, which means everyone has to be adjusted, including yourself. So. It's an interesting thing when I see how divine will play to beginning, middle, and end. And what would appear to be in the beginning very unknown and almost crazy, destructive, would play in, on the end very well by Krishna's will. And what would be some, you know, kind of a illusionary perception 
on very like a general level of your own imagination wouldn't work like so in other words it's very difficult to think oh I can change the world which everybody w wants to do so Lao Tzu the Chinese philosopher he said you cannot change the wind but you can change the cell of your ship that you can change the wind wind is going to blow this way or left right south straight but you have to always adjust your cell so that whatever even the negative angle of the wind with the proper cell angle can take you forward in your progress and believe it or not the best movement of the ship is going against the current but you can't just go straight you have to take a little angle here a little angle there so so that means if you really want like the sweet nice wind always blowing your ass it's not going to happen <laughs> because you're an ocean then you have to go wrong direction but if you do have a destination that's not going to happen maybe sometimes that favorable wind will move you towards the direction but you should not expect all this work for yourself so when we look at the number one is horoscope that's normally seen by stars because sometimes you have the period of success and flourishing sometimes the period to pay the bills and pay your karmic debts and that's very clear in Jyotish but then the question become do I really have any free will or does everything happens according to destiny or there there's some of my free will in that occasion so because like certain things like for instance death of Karna if you look at the Karna then you know he's he was a one of the Pandavas and not only one of the Pandavas he was the first you can consider the senior brother who should be the guy in charge of the family and his main a person that he competed with was Arjun and his born birth was unique because his mother was granted mantra by which she could apply that mantra any demigod would appear so when she did the demig the mantra she you know part of that mantra you have to at the name of that demigod then she did by accident then the son of God came the, the, the son came Surya and she's like oh Hare Krishna and Surya said normally when I've been called she's like I don't think I, I'm ready for it she said well don't worry you know the baby was going to come out of your ear which means our exchange will be divine and then what certain acharyas of Mad Madhva and his Satrani explain when like we have Avesha in our children like you know father mother grandfather in the child the Surya said don't think I just coming here for sexual exchange I pretty much have that opportunity on higher planets I'm coming here to fulfill destiny so if you think you're chanting this mantra accidentally you, you have a you you're wrong you have to deliver the child which will be part of something very unique that you'll say what is that because everybody now knows Abadud Marj is conspiracy theorist but not everybody knows that conspiracy theory is coming from Acharyas because he's, they say <laughs> the earth oh it's very important they say the earth is always the battlefield ground ground of evil and good sometimes the battlefield happens on the higher planetary systems but normally it does happen on earth that's why Ram comes here Krishna comes here and Krishna saying in Bhagavad Gita you know Sambhavanti Paritanaya Sadhana Vinashaya Chudushkritam so so where's that Dushkrits they're coming from all over the universe and also when that battlefield of conspiracy because it appeared to be the kingdom of this and that but Madhva say no no don't think like this 
Don't think it's two ancient kingdoms fight because then you limit to time, place, and circumstance. What you should understand, it's not a historical or mythical occasion. It's the divine evil and divine divine meet and battlefield on planet Earth where Krishna descent himself, and this is by his will. So through the whole universe, like for instance Duryodhana, he was disciple of Balaram because he's got blessing of Ananta Shesh to become Duryodhana in, in this battlefield. So he was the king of Navata Kavachas. So and you know, so all these beings, like you say, Shakuni was demon, his guru was demon. His guru was Brahman Kanaka, was demon. So their demons came and they took form of humans. And they played their own politics. They, they, they had their own vision of how they went around things, and, but they were demons. You know, Dushasan, Duryodhan, Hundred Sons, and they were meant to be killed. However, there's eternal play fight going on between the gods. So, Vali were killed by Ramachandra. He had the, the mala, the Surya mala that he gave to Sugriv. He was also Karna in previous life. So Bali is coming as, as karma, next reincarnation. And coming, and even in this life he should be killed again. But how he would get killed, that's, I will tell a little bit later. So, but first you have to understand divine conspiracy. So Ram Lila, Krishna Lila, uh, Gaur Lila, all connected. Like Hanuman and Ram Lila, he's become a Bhima Sen in Krishna Lila, he become Murari Gupta in Gaur Lila. Same identity and end of the story, he's a, he's a Vayu Pavana, he's expansion of Vayu Pavana, or Haridas, Thakur, Brahma, you know, so they put their Avesh, because otherwise you think, oh, Haridas, Brahma, how is that possible? Brahma is there, Haridas is here. Putting Avesh, putting himself, just like you're putting yourself into your child, that's what call Brahma Haridas, or sometimes they would say, oh, in this person, Prahlad Maharaj, or, or like Advaita Acharya, he's half, he's, he's known to Mahavishnu or Sadashiva, but Mahavishnu and Sadashiva, like at the time of creation, Mahavishnu and Sadashiva become joined with Maya Mahatattva. So it's pretty much when Vishnu look at Maya, he become Sadashiva. When he look at Krishna, he is Mahavishnu. So a certain function, because he, Mahavishnu does not interact with Maya. So Maya is the business of Shiva. So she, just like when you look at beautiful women and you can have a sexual exchange by your eyes, but Vishnu never be will, under control of Maya. So his glimpse at Maya becomes Shiva. And that glimpse have enough male potency to impregnate the Maya with all the living beings. But really, all the living beings coming from, you know, Sankarshan, or who is expansion of Mahavishnu. Mm -hmm. but, but the process in the material world must be, you know, the virtual reality must be done in a particular way, so that is, so then we can understand all these divine gods and goddesses like Parvati, I'm oh, sorry, uh, Drupadi, she had five, five goddesses in her. That's why she's the most chaste woman. So each of the goddesses share a different husband, which is different demigods. So, but all these five goddesses was cursed by Brahma, but due to their pleasing, oh, please don't separate us. He said, okay, in, in the world they're dealing, you'll become one, but you become the most chaste because you really will connect you with your husbands. Then, from that point of view, Hanuman and Bhim and Murari Gupta connect with Pav and Vayu, who again has 24 different Vayus, etc. So it's a complex thing. It's, it's known to Acharyas. It's not like this kind of Mahabharata. Nobody will explain you, but you know, great Acharyas, that's their things to explain you who is who, why, 
And then it makes a lot of sense for eternal conspiracy that every Leela connected. So somebody in one life, like Vali, has presence as Karna, but again, when Karna coming to Parashuram, because his name is before Radheya, and his so-called son Sutta of Radha, Radha is the charioteer. And charioteer is lower than Kshatriya, because he runs the chariots, he runs the horses. It's also fighting, but his main thing is to run the horses. So he's been trained to run the horses. But when his father look at him, he never has interest in horses. He's interested in bow and you know fighting, bow, arrow. And suddenly he's leaving his house unsatisfied and going to Parashuram. And Parashuram say, oh, my child, who are you? He said, I'm the son of a Brahmana, because he knows Parashuram will not accept. OK, then I will accept you. Then finally, Indra think, well, if I don't adjust Karna right now, he might be able to kill Arjun. Then Indra takes form of worm, and when Parshuram is very tired and sleeping, the Indra beat Karna's lap because he's sleeping on Karna's lap and piercing through his leg and biting, par- biting Parshuram in the head with blood. And Parshuram wake up like, oh my God, somebody bite me. And then he look, Karna has whole leg and like bleeding. And he said, well, what happened? And then he see that worm, which also, that worm actually was, um, the sun got charity or demon. Cheta and Pracheta, the two, they're sitting on, on the chariot, little demon figures. So he was cursed by becoming a worm for doing something, some kind of apparat. So that demigod become a worm and pierce through and bite Parshuram. But Parshuram is the Supreme Lord himself. He's like, okay, you are tolerating so much pain. That is not possible for Brahmana. Only Kshatriya has quality to tolerate pain. But it says in Bhagavatam, it says in Bhagavatam, Brahmanas by nature, they have very like explosive nature and then they will be pacified. So Kshatriya is different. They never have an explosive nature, but internally they have big fire, they will never forget things. That is the quality of Kshatriya. This, that part of Bhagavata is mentioned about Dhruva. When Dhruva doing something, then it says, well, he's a Kshatriya. So he will, his nature is to accept challenge. That's why Yudhishthira, he couldn't deny challenge of dice game. Although he knows full of, mist- you know, full of cheating, but just couldn't do it because he, Somebody explore his kshatriya nature, and kshatriya nature is comparative. Okay, let's compete, because kshatriyas are about competition. Brahmanas are different. According to shastras, brahmana live by what he's been giving. See, that's why brahmana, he normally, he's a good advisor, but not a good businessman. And brahmana, he be always seduced by donation. That's why to take is to be seduced. And therefore Drona, being a Brahmana, wouldn't want to be doing that. Because he knew if I start accepting money from the kings, then I have to play the game of the king. But when Ashwatthama born, Ashwatthama was his son. He's also partial expansion of Shiva. But that time, Drona, who was a schoolmate of Parashurama, they fight together, practice together, got married, and his wife understood, I'm marrying a Brahmana who's never going to do any work. Then she had to think how to maintain family. They were so poor, they didn't have a cow. So when Ashwatthama grew a little bit, he wants the mother's milk, and she had no milk, she had to 
take a rice powder, milk with water, and give it to Ashwatthama as milk. And Ashwatthama would be drinking that milk powder, uh, like om. What kind of milk would you like? The almond or he has this vegan milk. He would be drinking. Some people would be very happy, very excited. <laughs> but one day when he was playing with the kids, he went to somebody's house, and their mother said, "Okay, kids, I'll give you some milk." So she had a cow, she gave them cups of real milk. So he's tasting the real milk. I've never tasted such a beautiful substance. I'm drinking milk every day. So he came to mother and said, mother, can I have some milk? And so she's like, okay, there's milk. He said, mother, what did you do to me? Why did you lie to me? The mother started crying. She said, ah, you don't. You don't understand who is your father. He was one of the most brilliant men, but he will never be corrupt by serving the low kshatris. He will never serve the low kshatris. Then when Drona came back and he saw his wife crying, the cup of milk, and he discovered, then he said, uh, you know, it's like so much painful, so he said, I have to go to my friend Bhishma, who I used to practice martial arts with, and I just got to get a job. And as he'd been approaching the Hastinapur, he knew the Kalari, the fighting school where the practice, and he saw Pandavas, and it was some divine revelation. They lost their play ball in a, in a well all dry well, so they all look at the well, they have no rope, nothing, how to get to the well, how to get that bowl. And Drona here understood, okay, these are the Rajas, Rajaputras, the princes. I have to excite them. So he said, oh, my dear fellas, what are you looking for? They said, oh, you know, we lost the bowl, we don't know how to, we don't have a rope, we cannot go there. He said, isn't that you look like uh, the warriors, the Kshatriyas? They said, yes, we are. Then the Kshatriya, he can fight with anything. He's in any circumstance. He will manage. Said, yes, but how to manage, we don't know. Said, okay, look. And he see like kusha grass, dry kusha grass. So he take blade of kusha grass. And he's like, okay. And he, one kusha grass pierced the bowl, and he took another kusha grass, pierced in that kusha grass, pierced another one. So he made a rope by which he pulled up the bowl from the well. And they were so impressed, they couldn't believe that there was such a person. And they said, like, who are you? He said, ah, you go see your grandfather, they tell some of his old friends. They tell him what I what that old friend did. So they went to like look, grandfather Bishma and they said, Wow, you know, we met this amazing Brahmana who was like then Bhima understood. Bhishma understood, oh this must be Drona. So he came to receive the drona and embrace Drona. He said, I you know um, at any moment uh, you are my friend, and I'll take care of you. I, I know you have a family, and if you are willing to be the Raj Guru, we, we feel that these kids need to be raised as a great heroes, and you are the man. So Drona took the job, but when Drupadi were completely humiliated by Duryodhana and Dushasana, Neither Bhishma or Drona could say anything. They were like, when, Duryodhan, when Drupadi told them, you must be the people who follow the Dharma. Do you think that's how you treat? You know what happens, that this Duryodhana, you know, wretched with Shakuni, cheat my husbands, and by cheating, 
soccer them to the game and win our kingdom, our weapons, and enslave them and made me slave. And now they want to take off my clothes. Is that happened in front of you and you were sitting quiet? So that you can understand, it's not only Acharya board or somebody else. Certain people can be sitting quiet, just like right now in the United Nations or Russian Parliament, or because people know something very wrong is going on in the world. But because of their corruption and fear of the self-preservation, see that's why you need to understand the root cause of conspiracy. Otherwise, you become superficial conspiracy. You think, because conspiracy is not what most people think. It's to understand the divine nature, the human nature, and why bad things happen in this world in presence of the whole society. That's called conspiracy, actually. <laughs> yes, because like if somebody getting certain medical procedures and uh, certain people make trillions of dollars and you know, what do, they, what do they care about you when they care about themselves? But everybody else sit quiet because somebody get paid, somebody told you're going to lose your job. And, and somebody who like say, wait a minute, wait a minute. Like even Drew Party had to screen in front of all these great heroes. And none of them moved their, his hand to help this beautiful, powerful and honest woman. Then she obviously closed her eyes and she started praying to Krishna. And Krishna sent her endless sari. So that means sometimes you think, oh, there are people that would appreciate your position and they will take a side. But if you really look at Mahabharata, if you really look at the history of human dealing and relations and politics, if people would live by the honor and by the heart, 99% of what happens in the world would never happen. So great acharyas, they explain, the reason in Mahabharata great heroes died, two reasons. Number one, one group of heroes were demons. Although they were great kings, they were demons. And in the presence of Krishna, they wouldn't want to recognize Krishna. But then the question would be why the great spiritual heroes died, the proper people that follow the Dharma in heart. And here's the answer. If they would not be removed by death from this world, Kali Yuga would never happen. If Maharaj Parikshit would not be cursed and descend this world, they would not let this bullshit happen. They would not let these things happen the way that they are. Do you understand? Because that they're the real people of the truth. They would look at the situation and say, no, I can't accept this. But to remove this kind of people, then you're entering a world of chaos, which means democracy. Remember, Bhagavatam is very clearly about kingship, which means like an ideal leader. Bhagavat never support democracy. In fact, that's a conclusion of Bhagavat. But to draw the proper meaning of Bhagavat is not just enough to understand what Bhagavat is. Because Bhagavat deals with history of the humankind, with the creations, the, you know, the mystic yoga. So, because it's the Mahapurana, it's the best of books. And partially it's starting with Mahabharat. But you would say, why is that a certain part of Bhagavat mention certain aspect of Mahabharat, which if you don't know Mahabharat, you won't understand what Bhagavad talks about. Because it mentions departure of Pandavas to the Himalayas where they died. And you know, first died Drupadi. And only Maharshi Dishthir was claimed, he was the only person alone. And he went it's another story, it's, but the Bhagavad set up the mood of separation because it begins with explanation that at certain points, the Pandavas, they just understood the Lord left this world and they lost every interest to their own kingdom, to the ruling ship, to, you know, to, 
they lost all kind of interest. It would appear to be they were, they were excited about ruling the kingdom and be the kings and rule even with justice. But the way Bhagavads bring its own part is that they have no interest because Krishna is no longer here. So if Krishna is no longer here, what is my interest in wealth, position? And obviously they want they want to establish Maharaj Parikshit and you know the great the great succession. But you can see even in that course as gradually went and Kali Yuga took over. So when there's no light, enough light will be dark coming. When there's no fresh cleaning of the kitchen or bathroom, there'll be cockroaches and things come naturally. So when lack of Krishna consciousness, there'll be doubts and quarrels and uh, misunderstandings due to the nature of this world. So remember, we live in a world that has particular nature and that nature of the world will manifest itself through certain environment. But Guru Maharaj said environment is friendly. Don't blame the environment because Maharaj Parikshit, he didn't say, oh, you know, I was cursed. And according to tantric power, every mantra can be stopped. Actually, it says in Mrityu Tantra, where the mantra is to kill, the instruction is there. It says, every mantra, if it's giving to, first it says, you cannot use this to devotees. It's not in Tantra by Shiva. Second, it says, if person the powerful than you, more powerful than you, this mantra will come back to you. So then you have to understand who you're dealing with, with the challenge, if you use this for saints, that will destroy you. <laughs> but, but if this person that you're trying to destroy with that mantra has more mystic power or, or more Shakti, more Tejas or just than you, that will come back to you. Number one. Number two. It is says every mantra can be contract. That's why when the son of Brahman occurs, Maharaj Parikshit, the other Brahmana said, well, yes, he recited the mantra to curse you and you'll be killed in seven days, but through our tantric power, we can create another mantra that will, same curse will come back to him. So then, Ma, then Maharaj Parikshit said, so I offend his father, that's my guilt, so now you want me to kill his son. He said, I'm not going to do that. Then you will have to die. He said, well, he's just a child for the sake of the kingdom, the, the life of one citizen. He said, yes, that might be truth, but not within my thing. I don't want to be cause of trouble to spiritual Brahminical society because if the society will not be functioning, then the world going to the end. Number one. Number two, I cannot be cause of any injustice, even if it's my personal injustice. I have to pay for it. Then, okay, then you should be prepared to die. And he said, yes. Uh, if somebody has to die, what would be most beneficial? And then different advice has been given by different rishis and munis, but sadly everybody would want to hear what Shukadev would say, because he appeared to be liberated soul, which already evolved to the level of liberation. So let's hear from liberation group. You know what? What do they think? And what we know is Namas and Kirtan Yasya Sarva Papa Pranasham. So going to the world of Sankirtan and chanting holy names of Krishna. Therefore, you know, it's extra beneficial to do this at time of Kartik. And next to us is Radha Damodar Mandir, which it's amazing to think sometimes that what we've been giving from our gurus, because certain people say, well, Chaitanya Saraswat Mahat is philosophy of Guru Maharaj. But I think it's philosophy of Guru Maharaj, it's the temples of Navadvipa and Vrindavan, it's the holy places, it's the deities, it's the devotees. You know, it's not just the books or philosophy. Because philosophy has to be apply into devotees, the community, you know what I'm trying to say? Yes, if you just have the philosophy, maybe you can convert others, but eventually, you know, Krishna say, you know, 
myself, the Vyasas and the Spoon, the Brahmana, which means it's not just book or it's not just ideas, it, because ideas without fulfillment, you know, what is their price? There are so many ideas and execution. That's why we have a theory and practice. So in theory, we're all divine saints. In practice, it's revealing our pants normally in a very short time. So in theory, we clean, but in practice, things going a little smelly. So, because otherwise, if we just talk about theory without putting this theory in everyday practice in our life, you know, we, we could be, you know, a bunch of guys who watch TV and talk about, you know, war and, you know, have the rifles on their couch and, but, you know, when the time comes to defend your country and that's what, what happens right now. So I just spoke today to one guy who's uh, used to be a big mafia guy and he joined one of our festivals in Kiev. And uh, he likes the devotees, but he's like, you know, you can say his face. I mean, I can sense this kind of people. He's from like hardcore criminal environment. And, you know, I preached to him and he really likes devotees. He's, he's been in jail. He's got some physical problems. I said, well, try this Ayurvedic stuff. You know, like I, I'm trying to like, and he really liked one of our devotees named Arjun, who's a Russian devotee. And he called me like this Arjun stuck in the airport. He tried to flee from Ukraine to India stuck in the airport, finally, through Ami seemed to help, he's got on the right plane. But Arjun called this guy, and this guy right now fighting. He's in the f fighting lines. And he called me up, he said, I said, oh, how are you doing? He said, well, you know, fighting line. And he told me, like, you know, we got, you know, like, he said, like, it's so funny, like, we have to kill a lot of people. Because all these Russians that are coming, they don't know how to fight. So we just... But, you know, he's a kind of a guy who can kill you with no blink of eye. And, and, but he told me, like, look, I'm defending my motherland. I said, I said, I'm not worried about how many people you kill. What I'm worried about, you should listen to Mahabharat and Bhagavad Gita and preach to people. Because I know, you know, you're in circumstance, I'm not going to tell you, oh, don't fight, be, you know, like, if it would be somebody else, this guy, I'm not going to say, I, I know he's kind of, will go that way. And he's a tough guy that will do this service. But I said, in whatever circumstance it is, as I remember, you spoke with me about Krishna and Gita, I said, this is the most needed right now. So I'll try to preach to people. And I sent him, like, the Bhagavad Gita, the Mahabharata, because this is about war, so try to understand the purpose of the war. But, see, that means at certain moment of our life, the reality within our theory will become in our practice, and we have to realize how do we have to deal with this situation? How do we have to deal with this life situation? Should we go for the benefit of ourselves, or we have to sacrifice for the higher truth? And that will reveal who we are, in tr not in our own estimation, in reality. And so that's called practicing life. And Gurudev many times talk about that. We try to preach in practice. And when we practice, it's not just, you know, putting up tilak and dress. Otherwise, people have double life, you know. I'm, here's my professional life. Here's my spiritual life. Here I am here with tilak and dhoti. Here I am with, like... And my work in suit, you know, uh, you know, once a week I become a Vaishnava, the rest of the time I do this. But that's not what real practice is. The practice is to continue your struggling, you know, because remember, most people are struggling. Like, you know, it's so funny, in, in the Western culture, people struggle so much that you can't even say this to people. <laughs> like, in our culture, if you say, like, oh, fine, in Russian culture, you don't have to say, I'm fine. Yeah, you can say, I'm not fine. All right, what's happened? Uh, this is, okay, yeah, don't worry. Get some vodka. But in Western culture, you pretty much 
have to like, oh, I'm fine. Like you have to fake it to that level that you're fine. But we know most people are not fine. So I met one gentleman. They said, oh, this is Swami. And this guy, he born and he born into, you know, devotee families. And this person said, hey, um, I'm working with wheat. I said, oh, very nice. He started explaining me, he said, oh, because wheat is very like this THC, CBD, they try to justify what he's doing. I said, look at all these people on this wheat party. They're pretending they're happy people. Every one of them has psychiatrists, psychologists, everyone is psychologically damaged, you know, and, and they will tell you that's the only way to do this because it's a painkiller. So I said, try to understand, this is a painkiller. And sometimes you need to kill your pain. But that's not what spiritual life is all about. So don't try to say, oh, this equal to a meditation. You know, maybe some Mayavad meditation. I would rather smoke. <laughs> but, well, which is which is true. If, if, if the meditation means to knock you out, you know, just take dope and be knocked out. You know, people do this all the time because they can't stand reality. And so they do suffer. And, and they think somehow they will resolve their suffering. But we all know the only way to resolve any kind of suffering is to preach and practice Krishna consciousness, to engage in Harikata and Krishna Kata and share with devotees. And, and sadly, as it says in Bhagavad, sadly all your doubts and clouds will go away. Because your problem that you believe a problem will become a small, small thing. Because you, Krishna consciousness dealing with like mortality, beauty, you could go above mortality and immortality, go to true love, true beauty, true perception. All these things are so amazing. So for the time you're on the program, you're fine. But when you get off the program, you start dealing with reality again. And you would think, oh, why is that so? When I was in Krishna Kata, I was so happy. Now I'm so unhappy. What's the nature of this world? But really the nature of this world to push you out of this world. This world is not meant to please and fulfill. And suddenly you have to deal with your own death and like disease and old age. And like I started realizing I don't remember certain things because my brain has been shot down to diabetes, but also I can barely walk sometimes. And Gurudev used to, he also had a leg problem. He couldn't walk, so he had to ride a scooter. But once you stop walking, your health goes down less, more and more and more. So you kind of have to, you know, do something. So, you know, I, and I was, follow one doctor who explained exactly what to do if you want to live. And I understand, it sounds like Krishna consciousness, what he said. Because he said, if you go about these numbers, you're done. If you go low, that, you're done. But to keep that golden age, you have to do certain sadhana. He said, once you learn how to do sadhana, you can go on for a long time. Once you stop doing the sadhana, you'll go down or up, and that will be... So in Krishna consciousness also, it's like, if you go do what is beneficial for Krishna consciousness, then you can go to the whole world of suffering and most likely you're going to manage. But if you deny that recommendations, which giving us by saints to Krishna, then you have to suffer. And I understand, yes. I understand I'm suffering for certain things, which is Suffering is the best medicine. No pain, no gain.